chapter 19. So remember, yesterday when we were reading, Alcatraz had just, I don't know if he officially defeated Blackburn, but he touched the Firebringer's lens so that it fired backward and then it shot into his one eye. So now he's the no-eyed, not oculator. We'll see what happens. I apologize for the last chapter. It was far too deep and ponderous. At this rate, it won't be long before the story stops speaking of evil librarians and instead turns into a terribly boring tale about a lawyer who defends unjustly accused field hands. What do mockingbirds have to do with that anyway? I scooped up the firebringer's lens, spinning toward the thugs who still held my grandfather. The librarians looked down at the fallen oculator, then back up at me. I raised the lens. The two men dashed away. In the fury of the moment, I didn't even realize that I'd finally been able to pick up the lens without it going off. Grandpa Smedry slumped back against the wall in exhaustion. However, he smiled at me. Well done, lad. Well done. You're a Smedry for certain. The other thugs in the room backed away, towing their hostages. There are two of us now, Grandpa Smedry said, riding himself, staring down the librarians. And your oculator has fallen. Do you really want to make us mad? There was a moment of hesitance, and Bastille seized it. She swung up and slammed her feet into the back of the librarian in front of her. Then she pulled herself free from her surprised captors. The other thugs dropped Quentin and Singh, then dashed away. Bastille chased after them, cursing and kicking at one as he rushed out the door. But she let him go, grumbling quietly as she turned to make certain Singh and Quentin were all right. Both seemed well enough. Blackburn groaned. Smedry, Grandpa Smedry shook his head looking down at the dark oculator. Should we do something with him? I asked. He's no threat now, lad, Grandpa Smedry said. An oculator without eyes is about as dangerous as a little girl. Excuse me, Bastille huffed, rolling over one of the librarian thugs that she'd knocked out before. She pulled off his sword belt and tied it around her waist. I apologize, dear, Grandpa Smedry said in his tired voice. It was just a figure of speech. Sing, would you do me a favor? Singh rushed over, steadying Grandpa Smedry. Ah, oh, very nice, Grandpa Smedry said. Quentin, gather up any unbroken lenses you can find. Bastille, be a, be a dear and watch for danger at the door. There are others in this library who won't be as easily intimidated as those thugs. And me? I asked. Grandpa Smedry smiled. You, lad, should recover your inheritance. I turned, noticing the glasses that still lay on the ground. I walked over, picking them up. Blackburn seemed disappointed in these. Blackburn was a man who focused only on one kind of power, Grandpa Smedry said. For a man whose abilities depended on seeing, he was remarkably short-sighted. So what do these do, I asked. Try them on, Grandpa Smedry suggested. I took off my oculator's lenses and put on the Rashid lenses instead. I couldn't see any difference, no release of power, no amazing revelations. What am I looking for, I asked. Quentin, Grandpa Smedry said, turning toward the small grad student. What do you think? I really wouldn't know, Quentin said. The legends are all so contradictory. I started. Hey, I understood him. That's impossible, Quentin said, still gathering lenses off the ground. I have my talent on. I'm gibberish for the whole day. Actually, you're not, I said, and you weren't truly gibberish those other times either. Did you know that your talent can predict the future? Quentin's jaw dropped. You can understand me? That's what I just said. Thanks for the hint about the rutabaga, by the way. Quentin turned toward Grandpa Smedry, who was smiling. No, Quentin, Grandpa Smedry said. I still can't understand you. I stood, shocked. What in the world? Then I turned, rushing over to Singh's gym bag, which lay on the side of the room. I unzipped it, digging through the ammunition to find a particular object, the book I'd swiped from the forgotten language room. I opened it up to the first page. The mechanics of forging a truth finder's lens are complex, it read but can be understood by one who takes the proper time to study. I looked up, staring over at Grandpa Smedry. The old man smiled. There are a lot of different theories about what the sands of Rashid do, lad. Your father, however, believed in a specific theory. Translator's lenses, they were once called. They gave the power to read or understand any language, tongue, or code. I looked back at the book. Yes, Grandpa Smedry said tiredly. Just wait until we show these to your father, if we can ever find him. I spun. So you do think he's alive? Perhaps, lad, Grandpa Smedry said. Perhaps. Now that we have those lenses, perhaps we can find out for sure. 
I wish I'd had a way to discover sooner. If I'd known for certain whether he was dead or not, do you think I'd have let you get raised by foster parents? I paused. Well, I guess the lenses won't help me when he makes no sense. I opened my mouth to demand more, but Bastille cut me off. Trouble coming! Librarian! The blonde one! I rushed over to the corridor and saw Miss Fletcher striding toward the room, a troop of at least fifty soldiers marching behind her. These men and women were armored with shiny breastplates. A few alivened lumbered in the background. Time to go, I think, I said, pushing Bastille back. Then I slammed my hand into the ground. The floor just in front of me fell away, blocks tumbling down to the story below us. I backed away from the hole with Bastille. Oh, very clever, Alcatraz, Miss Fletcher said, stopping at the pit's ed edge. Now you've trapped yourself. I smiled, raised an eyebrow, then pressed my hand against the back wall of the room. The bricks separated, mortar cracking. Singh came over and gave the wall a hefty push, toppling the bricks into the next room. I winked at Miss Fletcher, then reached down to slide a sword from the sheath of a fallen soldier. Miss Fletcher stood with arms crossed, regarding Blackburn with a sour expression. As I ducked out of the broken wall after Singh, who was carrying Grandpa Smedry. Quickly now, Grandpa Smedry said. We're late. For what? I asked, running beside Singh and Quentin. Bastille, as usual, ran ahead of us, watching for danger. Why, for our dramatic exit, of course, Grandpa Smedry said, sounding a bit tired. Miss Surly back there will try and cut us off at the front doors of the library. I'll simply make us another door, I said. We'll bust out the back wall. Ah, lad, Grandpa Smedry said. Haven't you realized? This entire building is inside a box of expander's glass, just like the gas station. Expander's glass is very hard to break, even with a talent. Besides, if you did, we'd be crushed as the entire library tried to burst out of the hole you'd made. Oh, I said as we reached a stairwell. Well, then, I have another idea. What? Grandpa Smedry said. I smiled, then reached into my pocket. I pulled out a small white rectangle, the library card we had taken off of the dungeon guard. The main lobby of the library was unusually busy for a weekday evening. People milled about perusing stacks of books, completely unaware, of course, that everything they saw was filled with librarian fabrications. They knew nothing of Alivent, of librarian cults, of smudries, or of lenses. They just wanted a good book to read. None of them were, unfortunately, able to check out this volume, not because it was banned, which it is, but because it simply hadn't been written yet. Those poor people may never know the joy they missed out on. Small children looked through picture books. Parents checked out the latest thrillers. The rebellious, troublemaking types looked through the fantasy sections. A few unfortunate kids ended up with meaningful books about dysfunctional families. Few of the people noticed the large numbers of librarians gathered behind the front desk, Fewer still noticed that these librarians were oddly muscular. What nobody noticed, however, were the weapons carefully stashed behind the counter. Miss Fletcher stood at the front of the group. She wished to avoid making an incident, but then, but when incidents were necessary, they could be contained. Smedries were far more difficult. Despite the buildup of libra librarian troops, most of the people in the room went about their librarianish activities. All in all, there was a sense of peace about the room. It was the joy and simple contentment that comes from being around books, librarian sanctioned or not. That piece ended abruptly as a door at the back of the room burst open and a group of dinosaurs rushed in. It didn't matter what the di that the dinosaurs carried books. It didn't matter that they were smaller than one might expect. It didn't matter that most of them wore clothing. They were dinosaurs and they were very, very realistic. The screaming started a second later. Mothers grabbed children, men ran, demanding to know if this was some kind of joke. Librarians stood, shocked. Their hesitation cost them greatly, for within seconds there was an air of general chaos in the room. That was when I burst through the door, carrying a sword, something I still figured I should have had all along. I was followed by Bastille, the Kristen, dressed in her stylish silver clothing. Quentin followed in his tuxedo, carrying Singh's gym bag, now filled with oculator's lenses. Singh came last, wearing his blue kimono and carrying Grandpa Smedry. The dinosaurs dashed ahead of us, inadvertent, inadvertently crowding the people against the checkout counters. A few librarian thugs broke through, but the others got trapped behind the desk, blocked by a horde of frightened people and excited dinosaurs. Bastille met the first librarian thug. She ducked behind. She ducked his sword swing, then shoved him aside. He fell as he hopped, as she hopped over him, waving her sword toward the crowd. The people shied back in confused fear. 
A librarian behind the counter raised an eyebrow. That's new, I thought, moving between the man and Bastille. So here are the dinosaurs checking out books like it's no big deal, just like normal. I stared down the crossbow bolt, thinking about just how dangerous it was. This last bit was, of course, to convince myself. I was beginning to get the hang of my talent. It only worked at a distance when the crossbow's bowstring snapped free, flipping the crossbow bolt uselessly into the air. The, the librarian watched it, dumbfounded, and I smiled, leaving Bastille to intimidate the people and therefore keep the librarians trapped. I rushed over to pull open the front library door. I held it for Sing and Quentin. Bastille left next, and I paused, turning and grinning at the packed room. One of the dinosaurs, the Triceratops, finally reached the checkout desk. He slammed down his pile of books and placed the library card on top of it. I'd like to check these out, he said eagerly. Miss Fletcher stood, arms folded as her soldiers tried to push through the crowd. She met my eyes, and I could see from her expression that she knew she was beaten. I raised my sword to her in a gesture of farewell. The blade immediately broke off and dropped to the ground. I stared at it for a moment. What? I thought I was finally figuring out how to control my talent. Miss Fletcher gave me a curious expression as if confused by my gesture, and I sighed, flipping the broken hilt into the room. Then I stepped out onto the sidewalk. Sing, still carrying my grandfather, and Quentin ran ahead, moving toward Grandpa Smedry's little black car, which waited where it had been parked. Bastille still stood by the door. She met my eyes. All right, all right, she said. You were right about the dinosaurs this time. I stepped aside as some brave library patrons finally pushed past me out onto the street. Your dinosaur friends are just going to get caught again, Bastille said. Charles said he'd try to get them to leave in the confusion, I said, joining her as we ran across the street. It's the best we can do. And it really was. Honestly, you have no idea how hard it is to work with dinosaurs. It's no wonder the librarians made up the myth about them going extinct. Pretty much everywhere in the free kingdom, everyone in the free kingdoms wishes that one were true. Sing set Grandpa Smedry in the passenger seat of the car, and Quentin squeezed into the back seat. Then Sing took the driver's seat, holding the useless steering wheel as the car took off. Bastille's silver sports car pulled up a second later. She climbed in, but I paused. My door had no handle. Finally, Bastille opened the door by rapping on the inside dash. The inner door handle is gone, she said, frowning. That's very strange, I said, sliding into the car. Now can we get going? She smiled, throwing the car into gear, and then she slammed down on the pedal. I turned, watching out the back window. Behind us, a bunch of librarians had finally managed to push their way out of the building. They watched in dismay as Bastille's car squealed away. I smiled, turning back around. I assume you have ways of making sure that the librarians don't just have some of their police pick us up. They don't work that way, Bastille said. The librarians keep as few people as possible informed about the true nature of the world. Most governments don't know that they're being manipulated. Now that we're outside of the librarian's central base, we should have a little breathing room, especially since we neutralized their oculator. I nodded, resting back in my chair. Oh, that's good to hear. I think I've had enough sneaking, chasing, and other ridiculousness for one day. Bastille smiled, taking a sharp corner. You know, Alcatraz, you're a bit less annoying than most Smedrys, I smiled. I smiled. Guess I'll just have to practice some more then. All right, that's the last of chapter 20, or 19. And they got out of the library safe and sound, with only a few bumps and bruises to show for it. Bye. Bye.